For this lesson, we'll be focusing on sampling theory. Sampling theory is a key process of converting analog signals into digital signals. Now, the key process to really focus on is the term sampling. Sampling is the process in which a continuous time signal is sampled by measuring its amplitude at a discrete instance. The goal would be to duplicate an input signal by using a minimum amount of samples needed. Now the term sampled is just the way it sounds. Anytime an analog waveform is digitalized, it's actually taking samples or measurements of the amplitude at particular points in time. It's just like a person at a production line is taking random quality samples to ensure quality assurance. Same case here. You're taking samples or measurements of a waveform and then logging those measurements and then outputting it on a digital wave. Now the number one rule in sampling, as well as any rule in communication, is knowing the Nyquist frequency or rate. The Nyquist frequency is the minimum sampling frequency, which must be at least twice the highest input frequency. And you also see uh, Nyquist interval as well, which is the minimum sampling period corresponding to the Nyquist frequency. So every time you have an analog signal being inputted to be digitalized, whatever that highest frequency is, the sampling rate or the sampling frequency must be twice that amount. So if you have 1000 hertz, you must minimum sample at 2000 hertz. Now there are defects that occur when the Nyquist rate is not met. This is referred to as aliasing. And aliasing is also known as foldover or undersampling. And it refers to the errors that occur when the input signal exceeds the Nyquist rate. So if you have an input signal of 1000 hertz, your goal would be to sample at 2000 hertz or better. However, if it's less than 2000 hertz, you're going to start getting aliasing, which means your output signal is going to appear lower frequencies than it really is. Now, the ideal way to combat this would be to just increase your sample rate, which usually is better because the more samples you have, the more it mimics your input signal. The other way to combat this would be to implement a low pass filter to prevent these higher input signals from exceeding your Nyquist frequency criteria. This is known as an anti aliasing filter. Now we'll go over this a little bit more in example problems, which we'll do next. All right, let's start off with an easy problem here. For this one, we're going to determine the Nyquist criteria for an audio signal, which operates between 20 kilohertz and 100 kilohertz. All right, so we're going to start off with the way we usually do. Let's start off with what we know and what we're trying to find. Well, what we're trying to find is the Nyquist criteria, which is F of S. We want to know the sampling frequency. Now to find the sampling frequency, we must determine our F of A, in other words, our maximum input frequency. The reason we want to do our maximum input frequency is because that's the maximum amount of sampling rate we're going to use for this particular conversion. So if we actually did 20 kilohertz times two, it would not actually be adequate enough to sample the 100 kilohertz input. That'd be the whole idea of using the max value. So the max input frequency in this case, F of A, would be 100 kilohertz. So just be aware, you might see problems where it'll give you a, a range between one or the other, and you always use the highest when it comes to the range when trying to determine your Nyquist frequency. And using the little formula to the right here, it's going to be F of S is greater than or equal to two times F of A, which in this case is two times 100 kilohertz which is pretty simple. And we don't need a calculator for that. It's just going to be 200 kilohertz. So right then and there, our sampling frequency needs to be 200 kilohertz or greater just to meet that criteria. All right, now that we got our feet wet, let's go do another problem. All right, for our second example here, this one has a little bit more illustrations to work with than just plain words. For this one, we're going to determine the Nyquist frequency requirement. This is just like the previous problem where we're trying to find the Nyquist criteria. So anytime I say Nyquist frequency requirement, it means the same thing. So same thing as before, we'll write down what we know and what we're trying to find. Well, the Nyquist frequency requirement, in other words, our sampling frequency, is what we're trying to find. Now we need to determine our maximum input frequency. Well, since this is our input, we need to determine the maximum frequency. Again, same as the last one, just a different way of asking. If this is an oscilloscope and you're looking at this, you want to determine the maximum frequency just looking at this. And this looks like it changes. 
like from here to here, to do one full cycle of this wave, it takes two milliseconds. And then from here to here, it looks about to be the same. However, from here to here, we actually have another full cycle, but it's one millisecond. And it looks like it does the same from here to here as well. So that's another one millisecond. And then it looks like it goes back to two milliseconds for a complete waveform. So looking at this, our frequency increases right here, which means our time is decreased. Anytime your time decreases, that increases your frequency. Anytime you want to find frequency, it's going to be one over time. Now for this one, the lower this number is, the higher frequency. So if I wanted to find the frequency of this particular input signal, it's going to be F equals one over T, which in this case is going to be one over one millisecond. And always be aware of these units down here, sometimes in seconds, sometimes microseconds. Just be aware. So that way when you plug and chug your calculator, you get the right answer. So if we plug and chug this in our calculator, it's going to give us an answer of 1,000 hertz. Now just to verify what I said earlier as far as the smaller this number is, the bigger the frequency, let's just go ahead and verify that by doing F equals 1 over 2 milliseconds. And if you plug and chug that in your calculator, it's going to give you an answer of 500 hertz. So your input signal right here, the maximum frequency I see, is 1000 hertz. So that's going to be F of A right there. Well, in this case, 1 kilohertz. So we want to determine F of S, which is your sampling frequency. And that's going to be greater than or equal to 2 times your maximum input frequency. So 2 times this guy is going to be 2 kilohertz. And that right there is your final answer. It's always good to get a few oscilloscope questions. That way it prevents you from getting rusty. All right, let's do one more problem. All right, for our last problem, this one's going to go a little deeper in the weeds to explain sampling. I provide an input signal as well as an output signal for these particular waveforms. The input signal is an analog waveform, and our output signal is illustrating a digitized waveform. So we want to determine the sample rate of the following signals. And does the sample rate comply with the Nyquist criteria, or does it call it aliasing? All right. So typically, we want to know, does this guy meet the criteria? Well, in our previous problems, our goal was to find our maximum input frequency to determine our sampling rate. Well, in this case, this one's going to be a little bit different. We're going to compare the input signal to the output signal to determine when it's being sampled to determine our sampling frequency. And that's not very hard to do. All right, first let's go over their input signal. Our input signal illustrates a complete cycle for a waveform. So it starts at zero and goes all the way to the end here. And the end here looks like it stops at approximately 7.5. That looks like one complete cycle for our input waveform. Now we can look at our output waveform and it almost mimics our input waveform, which is a good sign. Anytime your input mimics your output when you're digitizing your waveforms, that's a good sign. Let's jump right in of how to actually analyze this. Well, the first thing we're going to do is let's look at time zero. Let's look at this point right here. Well, at this point right here, the waveform is at zero, zero volts, which means our output frequency should be approximately zero volts as well, which it is. Now let's go to the first second, this guy right here. Well, the first second on this input waveform is about, I'd say about right there, which means if you look at the digitized waveform, it should be also right there. Now, right now, I have it going to these lines because right now it's sectioned off into different voltages. These are called quantization levels or Q levels. Now, we went over this a little bit more in some of our communications videos, uh, particularly the pulse modulation video. So if you want a little bit more detail of how we take an analog signal and digitize it, go ahead and check out the pulse modulation video. All right, continuing on. So we already have our first second, and it's right there. Well, the problem is from one second to three seconds, there is no change on our waveform. So does that mean there's no sample here? Or is it actually an accurate representation of our input? Well, let's take a look. So point two, go straight up. Point two is about right there. 
if you round down, it's going to go to this Q line right here, which is right there. So that's a good sign. So that's one, two. So, and then two goes across, stops right there. Now let's look at point three. Point three, if you go up, it almost hits that mark right there, which means three does go down and it goes to the next cycle. All right, let's check out the next one. For four, four looks like it goes right there, which means this is going to go across one second and should drop. It goes across one second and then drops, and that's point four. All right, let's go to the next one, number five. Five, if it goes up, it's approximately right there, which means it's going to be this line. Point four goes across one second and drops to point five. So that's correct. And then six, if you do six, it's about right there, which is correct. And then seven, if you go seven all the way up, it looks like, it's hard to tell, it almost looks like it goes this line right there. So the good news is this input mimics this output very well based on the fact that it seems to be sampled every one second. We're seeing a change, or relatively one change, every second. That tells me that we're actually getting a change or a or sample frequency of one second. So if you ever want to find out your frequency, it's going to be F equals one over time, which is one over one, which is pretty simple. It gives us a sample frequency of one hertz. So right there, we determine that we actually have a sample rate or sample frequency of one hertz. Now, does that sample rate comply with the Nyquist criteria? Well, our input signal has a full cycle after 7.5 seconds, which means f of a equals 1 over time, which comes out to be 1 over 1 full cycle, 7.5 seconds, 7.5, which comes out to be, if you plug and chug that in your calculator, it's going to give you an answer of, it's going to be 0 0.13 repeating hertz. So does this meet the criteria? Well, if we multiply f of a times 2, is it equal to f of s, or is it least less than that? Well, 2 times 0.13 equals 0.26. So the good news is f of s is greater than 0.26. 1 hertz is greater than 0.26 hertz. So that's a great sign, which means that this does comply with the Nyquist criteria, and it does not cause aliasing. 1 hertz was our sample frequency, and it does comply. So this is just another way of seeing how sampling works on a waveform. So anytime you want to compare your input and output, you can kind of give visual aid without even doing the strict math behind it. You could just look at it and tell, hey, this is actually being sampled to the Nyquist criteria. Hopefully there's enough information to get your feet wet. If you have any questions, please let me know, and I hope you all have a good day.